another edition of the Weekend Review with E.J. Borkart. Yes, welcome to another edition of the Weekend Review. Uh, this week we will be going over the first chapter of the Godard Brothers, and we will be reviewing what has happened in the story thus far for Rebellion and Aquar. Um, so let's get started. Uh, this week, the first chapter of the Godard Brothers went up onto my blog, and uh, it introduced you to the brothers Sanji and Alex, two extraordinarily brilliant and bright young children, uh, ages seven and eight, uh, Sanji being the older, uh, and they're having troubles in school because they're the teachers don't like the fact that they interrupt class to give a thorough explanation of the th things they are studying much much deeper than any fifth grader should know uh, they are seven and eight I want to repeat that um, and so they get sent up to their room to think about what they did until their father can get home and talk with them about it and they decide to do what all normal children would do they start coming up with a formula to promote hair growth and when they run out of paper, they continue to write it on their walls. I mean, I know I did that as a kid, didn't you guys? <laughs> um, so anyway, then, then we cut to their father, who is... Well, actually, their mother comes in next, and uh, basically flips her lid because they're writing on the walls. They should know better. So everything that they could write on, anything they could potentially even consider using to write is taken away from them, and uh, they are to wait there silently until their father gets home. Meanwhile, Alfred Godard, the boy's father, is at work and he's having a difficult time with science because he has this brilliant theory to uh, join inorganic matter to organic matter. If you like a little more detailed uh, description of that, uh, you can check out the Time Bubble interview that came out yesterday. Uh, it is actually with Alfred and he will tell you himself uh, about his theory. Um, anyway, Alfred is having difficulties with it, and his father shows up and tells him he's been invited to do another lecture at LaForne University, uh, the place where both of them went to college. And uh, they begin to discuss some of the different people in their family, how they're related to Agonel Godard, who was the uh, person who really brought robotic suits onto the scene for superheroes and actually brought the potential four superheroes into their world and then there was Jordan who you guys may recognize from the Super Morpher he has uh, done a lot of great things for science and uh, spoilers he's going to become Ryan's partner and fight in robotic suits which is going to be pretty gosh darn cool um, and then there's Mark who started, founded the KOTC, which is a children's detective series. Uh, actually, first book has been published last July. Uh, you can find it at lulu.com. Just look for the kids on the case. Uh, and then he also created a teenage detective agency. Going to be working on that one someday. And he, eventually he gets superpowers. And now he works for the government, keeping the whole country safe. And then there's Alfred, who's a biochem expert, a field that very few Godards have gone into. Uh, and they discuss more about just the things that their family have done and are known for. Uh, and then Alfred goes home and talks to his wife, and they agree that they need to try and get the boys into more advanced classes. And Alfred goes up to see what the boys have done, because he's seeing the basic part of their formula on the paper and he can't wait to see what they've done on their wall. And he has a talk about them about respecting those in authority, not writing on walls and just he brings up the idea of them going to the lecture to help him with it. And that is pretty much the first chapter of Rebellion, or sorry, of the Godard Brothers. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, the whole chapter went up yesterday. You should be able to find it on my archives page along with every other chapter I've written. And now, we will discuss what has happened in Rebellion on Aqua. Previously, on the Rebellion on Aqua. 
So, the story starts out with Terran, a young man on the planet Aquar. He was an orphan, was raised by Eugene, and now he lives at the orphanage as an adult and helps Eugene take care of the other orphans. He is also a part of the Rebellion, who is rebelling against the government on the planet because they are suppressing the people, giving them longer hours with less pay, and just all sorts of mean and terrible, nasty things that employers really shouldn't do. Um... The Rebellion mainly is led by a man named Scott Daly who owns or who operates the base on Aquar for Daly Devices Incorporated. Um, Scott is mainly using the Rebellion to try and slow down the government's harvest of quarite, which is a rare metal on the planet that is very useful for multiple things. Um, so that he can, and his company can harvest a greater share of the country, company, planet's resource. Um, and as such, the rebellion focuses on sabotaging government-owned mining sites. Uh, and one of these such sabotages, the government, or sorry, the Aquar enforcers is able to capture one of the rebellion members. And so a rescue attempt is mounted to try and rescue this young man. Uh, unfortunately. The rebellion members are uh, untrained and unskilled, and therefore they um, they all manage to get captured except for one who manages to escape. Finds Terran, tells him what has gone, what had, what happened. Terran goes to look for help from Scott. Scott says, "I told you guys to let the person in prison. You guys went in without me, or without my approval." So they can all stay in there as far as I'm concerned. And Terran steals a something that looks like a metallic glove on accident from Scott. And it turns out that this glove is part of a prototype suit. Uh, he puts the gauntlet onto his hand and a robotic arm appears over his arm. that gives him incredible strength. Uh, he uses this to break into the pedestal, which is the place where the government meets and the prisoners are being held. And he liberates them. He frees them. They are free. Uh, they break out, but not before causing a lot of damage to the building. Uh, and he's wearing a mask and hood when he does this. And so everyone refers to him as the Masked Man. Uh, the Masked Man decides that he wants to continue to do these attacks to hurt the government, to strike a blow for freedom, and to help the people. Uh, he approaches the rebel leader named John, the man who's actually in charge of the rebellion, um, and it says that he wants to work with the Rebellion to do more attacks like this. John says, no, stay away from the Rebellion, you come near them, I will take you out. And so the mass man, Taryn, tells John, you know what, I'm going to do this anyway, this is where and when. John goes and tells the enforcers, and Taryn goes and he blows through their defenses, starts smashing up the place until the enforcers manage to capture him under a net. Terran is able to escape because there's this is a piece of equipment designed for mining, so there's a drill attached to it. The drill gets the net off. He manages to escape. The enforcers attack each other in confusion. And as a result, uh, many of the enforcers die and are injured, and their commander, Jonathan, who was there, is demoted. Um, as a result of these attacks, the government has increased the taxes on every shop in the marketplace and so the price of everything has gone up many shops must close people can't afford to pay for things anymore the mine is closed there's miners unemployed and Terran can no longer get free bread free two-day-old bread from the local bakery to help feed the orphanage and the orphans uh, so they have no idea what to do now um, fortunately for them Eugene had taken out a loan from a local money lender known as uh, Frederick. Uh, Fred in exchange for not having to pay back the loan, Taryn has to work for Frederick to go and collect other people's debts. He went to collect his first debt, and um, he didn't have the heart to take the money from the people. They said they'd have the money next week. So Taryn returns to Frederick's place of business, tells them they weren't home, I'll have to go back next week, and Frederick allows Terran to believe that he believes that, and then he sends one of his men out there to collect anyway. Uh, and Terran is distraught about ha what has happened as a result of his interference, his work, his 
aid as the masked man, and he wants to give it up. He wants to turn himself in. He tells Eugene about it, and Eugene's like, we have to make it through this. We have to continue to do what we can, and um, maybe Troy, a man who grew up in the orphanage and is now a part of the Senate that meets in the pedestal, maybe he could help. Uh, so Taryn goes to meet with Troy, and Troy basically lets him know that he hates the masked man's guts, fortunately before Taryn uh, reveals who that he is the masked man. Um, anyway, after that, Scott decides, you know what, we can't figure out who this masked man is. Let's work with him to continue destroying government sites. But first, we'll have him attack one of my sites to throw suspicion off of me. So he gets together with John. John gets together with the mass man. They all talk a bit and they decide we're going to do another attack on one of my mining sites. Uh, the rebellion does not like the idea of working with the mass man. The mass man wants to remain separate from the rebellion so that they can't accidentally turn him in or do it intentionally. And they set it up so that they make sure the guard that's guarding the mining site knows that it's the mass man that did this before they knock him out. They completely destroy the, all the equipment and the mine itself. And then the guard goes to give his report to the pedestal saying, hey, the masked man did this to us. Uh, the pedestal is immediately suspicious that why would the masked man attack a privately owned mining site when he's trying to take out the government, or at least appears to be. So they send someone undercover to investigate Daily Devices Incorporated, and that is the story thus far. Now, I'd like to give you all a preview for next week's chapter. Um, so I'm going to let you know this. Um, it involves the infiltration of Daily Devices, and some discoveries are made that uh, doesn't necessarily prove that Scott's guilty, but makes him look suspicious. Um... And Taryn goes for another day's work at Frederick, and he discovers Frederick's treachery, and you get to see his reaction to that. And it then ends with the Rebellion having another meeting to discuss their next target and their next time that they're going to attack. And uh, you'll get to see a very, very interesting ending that spells trouble for the rebellion. So, that has been this week's weekend review. I want to thank you all for checking this video out. If you like what you saw, please leave a like on the video so I know to keep making more like this. Um, I wanted to thank you all for following my blog. It means the world to me. Uh, if you have any questions for me, leave them in the comments down below. I promise to answer them in one of these videos. Um, and I think that's all I have for you this week. So, I want you all to remember, it may be love that makes the world go round, but it's stories that makes the trip worthwhile. You all have a great week. Thank you very much. Bye. The Weekend Review has been paid for and brought to you by Godard Labs.